Sir, please begin. Okay. So a very good afternoon to all the viewers and uh, a very good afternoon to all the teachers as well as the student of Parul Institute of Law, Parul University. Uh, myself, Dr. Rajesh Singh, on the behalf of Parul Institute of Law, warm welcome, uh, senior designated advocate, Mr. Pallav Shishodhya, sir. Uh, let me, uh, the topic of this webinar is the bail provision in India, which is very much interesting topic. And uh, as a student of the law, everyone has to remember that how bail has to be granted by the honorable courts. So let us introduce about uh, Mr. Pallav Shishodhya, sir. Mr. Pallav Shishodhya is a senior advocate at the Supreme Court of India. Sir was enrolled as an advocate in 1984 and designated as a senior advocate by the Supreme Court of India in 2008. Sir is holding his practice in various specialization and he is have a very rich experience as a practicing senior advocate with regular appearance before the court and other forums. Uh, his wife, uh, Mrs. Sh Shalini Shishodhya is also a fairly successful mediator at the Delhi High Court Mediator Center. Sir has also successfully completed training at the mediator with the, chart with the Chartered Institute of Arbitration, CIARB in London. In the process, he got exposed in the uh, various uh, mediation of the conflict resolution and role as trained mediator which can play and to facilitate the negotiated settlement without any kind of adjudication. So not taking more time, I just uh, uh, having a very small short of description. Now I will tell uh, about our uh, provost, sir, uh, Dr. M.N. Patel is the provost of Arun City. Uh, sir, uh, sir, I just request you to warm welcome our uh, MNS speaker, senior designated advocate, Mr. Pallav Sishodhya, sir. Over to you, sir. Namaskar and uh, I welcome all, uh, including our uh, speaker of today and other participants on the occasion of an important discussion as stated by Mr. Rajesh. As we know that Parul University is uh, growing very fast, expanding the horizon in all the faculty, especially in the faculty of law, we are planning to invite the stalwarts of that area, so those who are the advocates or judges, and they are catering their uh, rather knowledge to our students and our students are the beneficiary. Today, we are lucky enough that we have Pallav Sisodhiyaji to be the rather the resource person and going to talk with our student. I'm sure about that our student will be beneficiary of that. And this is the way by which we are promoting our law education. We have a faculty member, but all are not that senior and they may not be able to give that type of information to a student. So obviously when we are calling the people like uh, Sisodhyaji, obviously their experience, their case study will definitely motivate and inspire our student to promote their study of law. As we are expanding in law, we have uh, so many programs running under the law, including LLM. And we have so many stalwarts also join as a PhD scholar in our university. So we consider ourselves as a lucky and whenever such type of program is there, our participant of student is very, very interactive, which I have seen. Students are raising questions in that area. And obviously, that teaching learning is proceeding like anything. I hope so that today's discussion also make our student inspired and may be very, very interactive in order to raise the questions and solve their doubts. Hope so that this type of interaction in future also from the expert will continue. With this, I again welcome you all on this occasion of this webinar uh, by uh, Dr. Palwa, uh, Sri Pralla Sisodiaji. So my best wishes to all participants because they are going to learn something good and especially congratulations to the Institute of Law where such type of high level programs are planned, arranged and executed. So best wishes to all of you. Thank you over to Rajesh. Thank you, sir, for your uh, warm wishes to our institute, sir. Now I will uh, not take you more time. I will handing this session to Mr. Pallav Sisodhya, sir. Over to you, sir, now. Uh, many thanks, uh, uh, Mr. Patel, for your kind uh, words. 
and putting me in the category of a stalwart. Uh, I and uh, many thanks, uh, Professor Rajesh, uh, for not only introducing me but introducing my wife also. That is a. <laughs> uh, it is. It really, uh, you know, sort of pampers one when one's one is praised along with his wife. Uh, so, so many thanks for your kind words. Uh, and uh, I must say that you know it's it's always a pleasure as well as, as privilege to be among the students and to talk about the basic concepts of law because. Uh, to be with students, you know, you are made to think about the basics and you feel like a student and you feel that curious mind and you feel that enthusiasm to learn. And uh, this is a wonderful feeling. Of course, this feeling would have been uh, much more if I was there in person among uh, and sitting with students and and having this talk and uh, uh, maybe in some future time we will will be able to meet but now the virtual meetings are the reality uh, a new reality in our life and and when we meet virtually at least some ideas are conveyed some some exchange takes place it is better than not meeting at all or not being with each other uh, just because we can't be there physically. So all my good wishes to all the students. Uh, uh, bail provisions is a very interesting topic for lawyers, for students. And at the moment, the kind of uh, uh, events which are taking place in our society, even for society at large, bail is a very interesting topic uh, these days. Now, before, uh, before I elaborate on the topic, you know, I would first like to, uh, like all of you to consider or think of what is the meaning of bail? Now, this is a very interesting thing because in CRPC, the bail itself is not uh, defined anywhere. And in one of the cases, uh, that is Vaman Narayan Gaya versus State of Rajasthan, and this was in 2009, two SCC page 281. Uh, students may note, I will repeat, 2009, volume 2, SCC, page 281. So what the court say, says is, I'll just quote two, three sentences. So court says in para 6, bail remains an undefined term in CRPC. Nowhere else has the term been statutorily defined. Considering it continues to be understood as a right for assertion of freedom against state imposing restraints. And then uh, it is found as a kind of a human right. It is also uh, uh, found as a kind of uh, security for appearance of a prisoner before his release. Now, you see the problem is that when in a society, when a crime takes place, uh, until the guilty person is convicted, there are two conflicting uh, de uh, demands. So one is the demand of the in liberty of an individual who is accused of a crime, but he's not convicted. And our jurisprudence proceeds on the basis that a person till found guilty is innocent. So now this innocent person, why should he be deprived of his liberty? At the same time, the societal interest demands 
that a person who has committed crime should be immediately taken in custody and he must be brought to book and be tried for the offense he has committed now these two conflicting considerations that is the liberty of a person and the interest of society and the state to book a guilty person and bring him before the the courts of law and to detain him till the trial takes place these are the two conflicting considerations in which context one has to see what the meaning of the bail or what is the purpose of the bail is and the court says that and i'll quote from the same judgment and i'll just again repeat the citation 2009 volume 2 scc that is supreme court cases 281 vaman narayan gaya so the court says that the law of bail like any other branch of law has its own philosophy and occupies an important place in the administration of justice and the concept of bail emerges from the conflict between police power to restrict the liberty of a man who is alleged to have committed a crime and presumption of innocence in favor of alleged criminal the accused is not detained in custody with the object of punishing him on the assumption of his guilt and therefore personal liberty is fundamental and can be circumscribed only by some person some process sanctioned by law liberty of a citizen is undoubtedly important but this is to balance with the security of the community a balance is required to be maintained between the personal liberty of the accused and the investigator investigational right of the police it must result in minimum interference with the personal liberty of the accused and the right of police to uh, investigate the case it has to dovetail two conflicting demands namely on the one hand requirement of society from being shielded from the hazards of being exposed to misadventures of person alleged to have committed crime and on the other hand fundamental canon of cr criminal jurisprudence namely the presumption of innocence of an, of an accused till he is found guilty liberty exists in proportion to wholesome restraint the more restraint on other to keep off from us the more liberty we have so now this is this is what uh, the conflict between the personal liberty and the interest of the uh, state are so well put by supreme court and this is what you have to think and you have to uh, learn in course of your study of criminal jurisprudence uh in so far as the bail is concerned that how do we strike a balance and uh between these two things and this is what the law of the bail is about now i must also tell you that uh, the bail uh this law or this area of law is also a very lucrative area of practice among the lawyers especially in the high courts and the and the trial courts where you know the the bail uh, uh practice or the lawyers who practice on the criminal side and uh, this is one of the most easiest area of practice with lot of money and also sometimes lot of unethical practices but you know that you don't need to bother but but you keep it in mind that the bail uh, uh area uh, or the area of criminal law for uh, grant of bail is a very lucrative area of practice now uh you know in in our country crpc and i must also tell you that uh, uh the time which is given is almost uh, 40 minutes to me uh but what happens is that uh, uh we lawyers are so much used to talking that 40 minutes are very small but at the same time if more time was given i can foresee that most of the audience gets bored that somebody is just talking on and on and it is so 
so keeping both the things in mind that uh, keeping this in mind that we have short time and at the same time uh, what i say should be interesting and educating for you i am going to give you few of the basic provisions and the uh, uh, concepts of the bail law so that you can uh, and and i'll give you some leading cases which you study on your own so that you are able to understand it more properly and it is no guarantee that within 40 minutes i i would make you some kind of expert on bail law but i will i'm sure that you would be able to understand some of the basics now in our country the uh, the fundamental book or the go to uh, source of law on the criminal uh, juris in criminal jurisprudence is the code of criminal procedure or what we popularly call crpc and crpc is because in criminal law apart from the substance or the merits of the case the procedure is also very important in criminal uh, administration of justice uh, because it is only through the uh, a society which claims to be a society governed by rule of law it can only be fair when a fair procedure is followed uh, for conviction or for trial of an accused whether it results in conviction or acquittal because either of the two a conviction must inspire confidence in accused that he has been given free uh, free and fair opportunity and at the same time acquittal must also inspire confidence in the society that a person who is acquitted he has been tried properly but it is only because of lack of evidence or in all probability because of his innocence that he is acquitted now section 4 of the crpc says that the crpc is applicable for all investigations inquiry and trials except otherwise provided and section 5 says that the code shall not affect the special laws in special in absence of specific provision now i have alluded to section 4 and 5 because we have apart from the what you call the traditional crimes under ipc of murder rape uh, uh etc there are lot of special laws like uh, unlawful uh, 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 prevention uh, act, uh, prevention of unlawful activities act or the pmla prevention of money laundering act or the ndps act etc which deal with the specific offenses like the drug peddling or the international activities or the money laundering or uh, you know in in company law there are also some uh, criminal provisions for uh, ensuring the proper uh, corporate governance etc so and there are so many laws you know like uh, the the drugs and cosmetics act or the prevention of adulteration act etc so all these uh, laws have their own peculiar provisions regarding the procedure for the trial to be followed and particularly about the bail which i shall come later on uh, and at the same time a lot of the laws uh, for for them the crpc has to be followed including for the bail of the alleged offenses under those special act now as i said in the beginning that there is no definition of bail as such but there is a definition of bailable offense which is in section 2a of the crpc and this is also very cryptic for a for a student particularly because the definition is that a bailable offense is one which is made bailable by sex schedule 1 and otherwise all other offenses are non bailable now again you know as a student i was i always used to be a little confused between what is called a 
bailable offense and a non bailable offense as if the non bailable offense is something that you can never get a bail and if you go to schedule one of the crpc you would find that most a lot of offenses particularly with the higher sentence of 3 uh, or more years or 7 years or the life imprisonment all are made non bailable and one would get the impression as if that you can never get a bail but that is not the situation and we should be very clear a bailable offense is something in which a person has to be released by police as soon as he is apprehended or brought before the police or the court uh so the bail is there as a matter of right and that is why these are called bailable offences and as all of you know that you know in our constitution liberty of a person is a fundamental right and article 21 says that nobody shall be deprived of his life and liberty without due process of law and one of the due process requirement under section 56 57 of crpc is that if a person is arrested or apprehended by police or any law enforcement agency within 24 hours he has to be taken to the judicial magistrate that is a judicial authority a distinct authority from the police and there has to be a judicial supervision or a oversight whether a person can be detained further or not either in police custody or judicial custody as the situation demands now at that stage under section 436 when a person is brought within 24 hours of his arrest by the police uh, when he is brought before the magistrate or the judicial authority designated judicial authority a person in a non uh, in a uh, in a who is accused of offense other than non bailable offense this is what the section 436 says that a person uh, i'll just uh, this read one sentence of that section uh, it says that when any person other than a person accused of non bailable offense is arrested or detained without warrant etc such person shall be released on bail so that is how in a bailable offense you get the because the expression used here is shall be released on the bail so a person accused of an offence which is bailable or an offence which is other than non bailable offence he has to be released on bail immediately so you have these cases like the dishonor of check which is a bailable offence so a person who goes pursuant to a summon of the court or uh, if he is uh, brought by police a person to a warrant he gets the bail as soon as he is produced before the court and the whole idea is of the bail is that that person is now available for trial as and when called upon but he shall otherwise have his normal liberty so that is the the other pop that is the main purpose of the bail that you are ensuring the liberty of the person but at the same time the interest of justice demands that that person now because he is now accused of a crime he should be available for trial and therefore he is now released on bail so 436 makes it mandatory for grant of bail in a bailable offence but when it is a non bailable offence the section next section 437 says that when a pers- when any person accused of or suspected of the commission of any non bailable offence is arrested or detained without warrant by officer in charge of a police station or appears or is brought before court 
other than the high court he may be released on the bail now you will immediately see that there is a distinction between 436 and 437 of shall and may 436 says he shall be released and 437 says he may be released now may confers a discretion on the court and now i must say that you know i i asked uh, professor rajesh singh that if there are some questions uh, uh, which the students have uh, they can ask me uh, in advance and one of the very interesting question i received is uh, that I, and i don't want to shut out the question i don't want to criticize the question uh, and i want to answer because a student should be able to ask any absurd question that is my my way of looking at it because only when they ask absurd questions or questions which are not so palatable they would be able to really understand the concept so the interesting question which is asked is whether a judge should be made criminally liable in case of gross negligence while de determining the adequacy of security or the bail now this is a digression from our topic but it is important because when we are considering that the law confers a discretion on a judge or a judicial officer and he can be of any level a magistrate or a or a session judge or a high court judge or a supreme court judge the whole idea is that law vest a discretion in a person who is well versed in law who knows that he would not exercise his discretion in a arbitrary or a fanciful manner but he would be informed by the judicial guidelines judicial considerations which i will talk later on and the requirements of rule of law and they are people of and he is a person of high integrity etc so therefore you know there are uh, areas of law where unless you confer a discretion on somebody the law itself can become very harsh and oppressive because if you have to release everybody on bail it becomes very problematic and if you don't have to release anybody on bail whatever be the crime or whatever be his role that also can become very problematic so therefore you have to give discretion and when you give discretion you have to also protect that person against any kind of uh of allegations of course allegations nobody can prevent these days anybody can make any allegation against anybody but a sufficient protection in law that he does his duty without fear or favor and therefore it is the requirement uh, or a very imperative that a discretion is given to some persons the judicial authorities judges etc and that discretion is trusted and there are of course other departmental remedies etc but we would not go into it so so a judge can never be uh, held criminally liable he may make mistake the higher court can correct it he may uh, exercise uh discretion in a wrong manner again the higher court can correct it there can be administrative action against him but the law would protect anything done in good faith and uh, law should protect a judicial officer for doing things though in a discretionary power but doing for his duty under the law now coming back to our main topic 437 section 437 of crpc confers a kind of discretion on the judicial authority the magistrate or the or the other judicial authority that per, when a person is brought before him who is accused or suspected of commission of a non bailable offence that he may or may not grant bail now there are certain conditions within this section that suppose he is a history sheeter or the crime is itself punishable by imprisonment for life or imprisonment for 7 years or more then in that case he would not be so released 
because then it is not the magistrate who can release maybe the higher court can consider the grant of bail at a later stage when we come to section 439 that is after a person who is accused of a crime comes before the magistrate he is produced before the magistrate within 24 hours of his arrest and that time he exercises his discretion whether to detain that person in police custody or judicial custody or to release him on bail now this discretion as i said like all discretion in law is not something that you can exercise in the way you like or in the in a, in a very arbitrary manner or you know you like somebody says so you grant him bail and you don't like somebody says so you don't grant him bail no it is not like that now there are well developed judicial precedents and uh, when a magistrate doesn't grant a bail under section 439 the session court or the high court can would have concurrent jurisdiction to consider the case of grant of bail for that accused person and at both the stages the factors which are common and for that purpose you know i would recommend all the students to read the judgment of sanjay chandra that is 2012 volume 1 scc page 40 i'll repeat it 2012 volume 1 scc that is supreme court cases page 40 now in in that judgment uh, uh it i am recommending this judgment because it is a judgment which uh, you know the the accused was accused in in the famous uh, 2g uh, allotment of 2g spectrum uh, by by government and there were allegations of collusion fraud etc now in this case uh, the the trial itself was being monitored by supreme court the trial itself was at the instance of supreme court but when it came to question of bail they said that you know uh, it is as much part of uh, rule of law uh, the bail itself is as much part of rule of law as any other provision and therefore even though the the uh, prosecution has emanated as per the direction of supreme court but the bail law has to be applied uh, in what in 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 its ordinary way and they have summed up the uh, law of bail in a in this judgment in a very uh, uh, comprehensive manner and therefore i would recommend all the students to to read this uh, this judgment and the the court has made a very interesting observation in uh, in para 11 of this this judgment uh, not not para 11 uh, uh, para 21 and i'll i'll just uh, read a couple of sentences that in bail applications generally it has been laid down from the earliest times that the object of bail is to secure the appearance of accused person at his trial by reasonable amount of bail the object of bail is neither punitive nor preventive so the idea is not that by arresting a person you are already punishing him because he can be punished only after he is convicted nor the idea is that by arresting a person you are going to commit uh, you are going to prevent Uh, him from committing further crime because this is again you know uh, a matter matter of conjecture that because a person has committed crime once he would keep on committing crime that's not the case because most of the crimes are committed for some immediate motive and they are for most of the criminals a single transaction event or a or a only one event in life uh, it's not that every time a person keeps on murdering uh, just because he has murdered once 
or every time a person uh, so uh, so the idea is neither uh, the object of bail is neither punitive nor preventive deprivation of liberty must be considered a punishment unless it is required to ensure that person will stand his trial when called upon the court owe more than the verbal respect to the principle that punishment begins after conviction and that every man is deemed to be innocent until duly tried and found guilty and then they say that from the earliest time it was appreciated that detention in custody pending completion of trial could be cause of great hardship from time to time necessity demands that some unconvicted person should be held in custody pending trial to secure their attendance at, at the trial but in such cases necessity is operative test in this country it would be quite contrary to concept of personal liberty enshrined in constitution that any person should be punished in respect of any matter upon which he has not been convicted or that in any circumstance for with the witness if left at liberty save in the most extraordinary circumstances so while you by granting a bail you ensure the appearance or the availability of the person for the trial it it should not uh, uh, it should not be taken as a kind of uh, you know you can So, so many times you come across cases where you you feel that yes that person is obviously the guilty but only after the trial you you would find that no this person is not guilty somebody else has committed the crime or at least this person has not committed the crime now therefore at this at the stage of bail most of the time it is not to be a uh, a uh, not to be assumed that the person is guilty and uh, as long as the requirement of the law that the person would be available for trial the bail should be granted now this is one one of the major uh, factors for grant of the bail or exercise of uh, discretion under section 430 uh, uh, 7 and 439 as also 438 i will come to that uh, later which which deals with what is called the anticipatory bail now uh, the the factors which are uh, which are repeated by supreme court time and again and there are so many judgments which are also referred in this this sanjay chandra so i would not give you more citations you can read all the judgments which are referred in the in sanjay chandra and the judgments referred referred in those judgments which are referred in sanjay chandra so you would have a good long list of reading now the first factor is that court will decide whether there is a prima facie or a reasonable ground to believe that accuses committed the offense now see this is where uh uh this is a stage where the police has only investigated and in our jurisprudence whatever police does the judicial authorities look at with a certain uh, suspicion or i would say critical eye so just because the police is saying that somebody is guilty that is not enough the the judicial authority or the magistrate or the court would examine that this material which the police is claiming uh, or forms the basis for the opinion of police to arrest a person whether it is reasonably believable that yes this person has committed crime of course subject to trial then the second factor is the nature and gravity of the charge so in in our practice normally a person say accused of murder who who would be uh, liable for a punishment of life imprisonment or a death sentence so he is normally not given a bail so a magistrate can jurisdiction but they would not be inclined to give of course 
it would all depend again on the facts and circumstances of the case in the sense that suppose six or eight persons are accused of murder of one person and the investigation reveals because at this stage we are concerned with what investigation says an investigation reveals that two of them were only observing they were not part of they were not party to hitting the the deceased or they were not actively associated with the crime so the court may so they they might have come in the group but they did not do anything now in that case the court may grant two of them bail and not to other four of them who actively participated in the crime so now this will all depend uh, so nature and gravity of the charge you have also have to see when there are several accused what is the prima facie material against all the accused so there are so many times occasions when out of several accused some are granted bail and some are not granted bail for the same crime because it will also depend on the role they play then severity of punishment in the event of conviction so normally the offenses where the uh, sentence itself is say 6 months or 2 years or uh, uh, so in those cases the bail is normally granted because if you keep a person uh, in custody for the pendency of the trial and you find him innocent at the end of the trial then you would find that the person is already uh, served the entire sentence because he has not been granted bail but at the same time this kind of provision leads to you know sometimes a very dissatisfactory result in the sense i'll give you one example that in a motor accident uh, a death which can be caused by negligence under section 304 uh, a the of ipc the, the punishment is only 2 years now we have now increasing amounts of road accidents negligent driving especially on the highways uh, sometimes people are killed and the accused are never brought because of the hit and run cases and even if they are brought they get bail immediately because they are punishable only by 2 years and then you know you keep on searching the accused they, they are not available and even if they are available we with the course of time the convictions rates is very poor so so <coughs> then the third uh, fourth factor is the danger of the accused absconding or fleeing if released on bail and uh, you all know some of the very eminent accused persons in our country who have escaped the dragnet of law and because of their money and resources they have settled abroad and they can't be brought to india and so so within our own country if accused is hiding sooner or later he can be brought to law but even then it results in disruption of the course of justice because the trial is delayed till that accused is again arrested the other accused are prejudiced etc so this would be one factor that considering the resources etc what are the chances or danger of the accused absconding uh, or fleeing from the uh, clutches of uh, judicial uh, criminal justice system then the other factor is character behavior means position and standing of the accused now you know there is uh, there is a very interesting story of one of our senior uh mr parashran used to tell us that before a king uh two accused of the same for the same crime were taken and uh for the one accused the king said 3 months and he was taken to custody and for the other accused he just told that accused you too that is oh you have also committed the crime and he let him off so his uh, darbar or the people in the court were were very uh, surprised that you are known to be such a just king and you deal with people with even hand and how can you discriminate that one person for the same crime 
you gave him three months of imprisonment, and the other person you said you too, and you let him off. So King smiled, but within an hour the news came that the person who who was let off has committed suicide because he felt so shameless before the king that that he was caught and he was brought before the king. So now this is just a story. These are all fictional stories, but this is to illustrate a point that when judges exercise discretion, they also see the character, behavior, means, position, and standing of the accused. So I remember one of the cases uh, I was appearing uh, against one of the former prime minister on behalf of uh, uh, of CBI, and the question came, and you know. Uh, one of the consideration before the court for granting bail was that yes, this person has roots in the society. What can he do? And ultimately, he was arrested in some other case. But then his house was declared as a jail, and he, he became uh, in a house arrest for a long time. So, so, th so this is how the the justice system also discriminate between people and people, and like in life. The judges also can't ignore the difference among the people. Then the other factor is that the likelihood of offense being repeated. And you know, in these sections also, there are provisions that if a person is a kind of history sheeter or person has an antecedent of committing the crime. So you, so you find sometimes that a person, and it, it happened a few days back that some judge who released a person on, on, on bail for some theft was brought before him after a week uh, for a, another theft in another house. So then he was told that, you know, because you keep on releasing people, they commit crime. So, so this is also, again, you know, uh, it, a judge would judge whether this person is likely to commit the, the crime again, if he is released on bail, then the reasonable apprehension of witness is being tempered with. Now, this is again something you have to, uh, a judge has to uh, evaluate from the material on record that, you know, considering the position of that person, whether he can be uh, trusted uh, or he would, he is such an influential person, he may be some big time politician or he may be some time, some kind of big time dawn or a, or a king ping among the smugglers and he would have such capacity or a gang or a support system whereby he can influence the witnesses. So then also the bail can be denied to him. Then the danger of justice being thwarted by grant of bail because sometimes what happens is that uh, uh, and, you know, uh, in one of the cases, uh, the bail was granted. Now, so these are the factors which the court will consider. And sometimes what happens is that the lower court can apply these principles rather over-enthusiastically. And so this, one of the cases of honor killing, the lower court judge or the district judge granted bail and the high court reversed it. In the Supreme Court, when the matter came, the Supreme Court said that the high court really uh, actually reversed it very uh, correctly. It should have been reversed and it has been reversed very correctly by the by, by the uh, <clears throat> by the high court. And this is a very interesting observation I would like to, to read for your uh, uh, thinking and benefit. Uh, this is 2017, volume 5, SCC, page 406. And uh, the court said that gravity of crime should have been taken note of by the learned trial judge, the deceased and his wife, that is the daughter of the accused appellant, because the father 
murdered his daughter for the honor, uh, what is called the honor killing, because she married against his wishes outside the community. So deceased and his wife, that is the daughter of the were staying in peace away from his community, but due to some kind of misconceived class honor, the, the vengeance reigned and the awe of law went on a holiday. The thought that their perception mattered and as alleged they put an end to the life spark of the young man. The choice of daughter was allowed no space. Her identity was crushed and her thinking was crucified by parental dominance, which has roots in an unfathomable unfathomable sense of community honor. And though the lovers became fugitive, the anger found in anchoristic values prompted by accused persons to annihilate the life of young men. In such a situation, the factors that have been highlighted by this court from time to time were required to be adverted and accused person should not have been granted bail. So here, if the court ignores the gravity of the crime, the higher court can reverse it. And that's why uh, in the beginning when I said that the discretion has to be exercised by a judge in a judicial manner and it is subject to correction by the higher court and therefore the judges personally can't be held liable either criminally or as civil liability for whatever they do in course of their duty. So with all these factors, now similarly you have uh, section 438 where a person can obtain a bail in anticipation that he may be there may be a fire against him or that he is likely to be arrested for a crime which according to him either he is being falsely implicated or his role is not uh, 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 of the nature that his arrest is required or that in the interest of justice, for the same consideration as you would apply in section 439, he should not be arrested, but he should be granted bail. And of course, most of the time in such cases, one of the conditions uh, put to the person seeking bail is to is that he should uh, cooperate with investigation, he should make himself for trial, and he should not run away from the clutches of the justice administration machinery. Now, even post convict and one of the judgments, this is of a constitution bench uh, of Gur Gurbak Singh Sibia, that is 1980, volume 2 SCC 565. You people must read this judgment. This is a very good exposition of law. I'll repeat the citation 1980. Volume 2, SCC, page 565. It's a constitution bench judgment. It's a judgment of now a little old vintage, but very well articulated for understanding the concept of bail and anticipatory bail. Now, in, a, in this, uh, there's also another aspect of the bail during trial in what is called the default bail. Now, the default bail is that under section 167, if you have alleged of a crime uh, which is punishable by life imprisonment or a death sentence, 90 days are given to police to investigate the matter and file a charge sheet. But if they don't file a charge sheet and the investigation is not conclusive, because the charge sheet is not being filed, because the investigation is, is not conclusive, whether a person is guilty or not, or what is his role, then there is a provision for what is called a default bail. So the bail has to be given as a matter of right. And if the offense is for lesser punishment, then the investigation is allowed only 60 days. So without filing a charge sheet, you cannot detain a person on the ground that yes, there is a prima facie material, he, uh, but uh, we are not able to file a charge sheet because now after 60 days or 90 days as the case may be, the investigation has to be definite that so-and-so is guilty for so-and-so reasons, for so-and-so material, 
and the trial is to take place with the uh, submission of charge sheet. Otherwise, what is called a default bail is granted. Now, after the conviction also, it is not that it becomes open and shut for an accused. There are provisions or there are situations when the higher court can suspend the sentence, which is also equal to granting a bail. There are situations where the higher court can grant a bail. So particularly sometimes in high courts that somebody is convicted and now there is a provision also under 436A that if you are in trial, if you are in custody uh, for more than half the term of the sentence prescribed, minimum sentence prescribed for the for the crime you have committed, uh, for which either you are standing trial or you are convicted, uh, if you have crossed the half the sentence, then merely because the trial is pending or the appeal is pending, uh, you should be then released on bail. There is also, you know, sometimes what happens is that suppose you are accused of murder and you are sentenced for imprisonment of life. And there are now cases where uh, after the conviction, the appeal remains pending for say more than 15 years or 20 years. And <coughs> so in those cases also, sometimes the bail can be granted because considering that even if the person is convicted, you serve the major part of the sentence and there's no point in keeping the person under detention. There's also provisions for release on probation. So that is uh, on a certain crimes, the person is released on probation on, uh, uh, on the condition that he would behave properly. And, but that is not a bail technically, but that is a release forever because he remains on probation for a certain period. And then if his conduct is good, then the sentence remains uh, suspended forever. Now, there are two, three other aspects of the, the bail law uh, because I would be concluding uh, before I uh, invite you to put some questions. Now, you know, uh, the bail application once rejected, it's not like a res judicata. So, uh, suppose a person is not granted bail in the beginning of the trial, but after some time, uh, he moves another bail. So the rejection of the earlier bail application is not a kind of a res judicata. In a civil matter, something decided at the interim stage, uh, some of the questions can become res judicata. You can't agitate again and again. But in criminal law, there's there is no such concept of res judicata. You can apply for bail as many times. But there is a very important rider that your subsequent bail application will be considered only if there is a change in circumstance. So what can be the change in circumstance? That suppose in a given case, the prosecution says that we have so and so as our star witness, or there are two, three star witnesses who are coming and who are the main witnesses on the evidence of whom the whole uh, question of guilt or uh, non-guilt of uh, the accused person dep depends. And in course of cross-examination or their uh, statement, you find that they, they are proved to be wrong or they are not enough to conclude of uh, finding of guilt against the accused and there is no other evidence which can have any uh, material bearing. Now in that case, at that stage, somebody can move a bail, another bail petition. It can be second, it can be third, it can be fourth and the court will then consider it afresh that in the view of the change circumstances, whether the bail can be given or not. Now in high court also, sometimes the bail can be uh, the bail applications can be filed as many times. There is nothing like res judicata. But again, there is an important uh, uh, 
uh, rider that the matter has to go before the same judge because you see uh, what because it's a discretionary power so so there are you know sometimes as we say that you should not only know law but you should know the judge also now there are judges who are very liberal in their approach of grant of bail and there are some judges who are not so liberal but little strict so sometimes you appear before a judge who is considered to be strict and your bail application is rejected now there was some practice of then again moving a bail application because it is not res judicata before the other bail judge when the roster changes and the courts uh, the supreme court has now laid down in some of these cases that it should go before the same judge and the same judge should be convinced of the change in circumstances and why he should deviate from his earlier order now this is another aspect that uh, a bail can be cancelled also and bail can be appealed against also now i have given you one instance of appeal that the bail which was wrongly granted uh was appealed against by the state sometime the complainant can appeal against that so in appeal the court will apply the same considerations afresh the appeal court will reappraise and then it will decide whether bail should be granted or not or whether the bail should be cancelled which is very different from a uh, cancellation of a bail uh, of a bail which is granted on merit but sought to be cancelled because the accused has not fulfilled the condition or has not abided by the condition so suppose some accused is found guilty of pressurizing the witnesses against him or approaching uh, uh to destroy the evidence against him or found guilty of uh, you know leaving the jurisdiction without permission so so suppose the condition is that you will not move out of jurisdiction of the court any violate said condition so there there are several instances when a person but here the court is not going to then again reappraise the grant of bail and consider those factors the court will only decide whether the bail which is granted already and granted correctly at that time should it be cancelled and has the accused really is guilty of interfering with the course of justice and uh, not abiding by the terms of the bail and <clears throat> should the bail be cancelled so so cancellation of bail for violation of bail conditions and cancellation of bail in exercise of appellate power these are two different things different considerations would apply now this broadly sums up the law of bail in the ordinary cases now there are some uh, speech, uh the cases of and i will just tell you one very interesting issue which is pending before the supreme court uh rajesh you uh, have three four more minutes because i want to tell about this very important yes sir yes sir yes sir why not ju judicial development now in uh, statutes like pmla uh, that is prevention of money laundering there there is a provision that a bail should not be granted unless the prosecution is heard that is one part second part because prosecution is normally heard you know, bail is granted only after notice to prosecution second part is that court comes to a finding that the accused is not guilty now this is very different from the normal presumption that the accused is not guilty till because he is not convicted but here the presumption is reverse that he because the person is accused of these crimes under these special laws like the uh, pmla and the uapa he is presumed to be guilty and now 
based on the material, the court has to come to a satisfaction that accused is not guilty prima facie. Now, this prima facie not guilty is a very difficult proposition because in all ordinary cases also, person is accused because he is prima facie guilty and he is to face a trial. But to say and to reverse the burden, it, so therefore, you know, in case of Nikesh Tarachan, this is very important judgment and I would recommend all the students to read it. This is 2018, volume 11, SCC, page 1. I'll repeat, 2018, volume 11, SCC, page 1, Nikesh Tarachan Shah. This is a judgment by Justice Rohington Nariman. It is very well articulated. It is also has a very good discussion on the law of bail. And also, so he set aside this provision as illegal, saying that we cannot reverse the burden of accused being presumed to be guilty and then have an inquiry whether he's prima facie guilty or not, and then only grant a bail. Now, this judgment was, uh, uh, after this judgment, the PMLA Act has again been amended. And there are certain amendments made. And these amendments are, have been subject matter of challenge. The, the hearing by a larger bench of three judges has been concluded and the judgment is awaited. So as and when this judgment comes, I would recommend that you people read this. And uh, this is another very important judgment because the important personalities involved, that is judgment in case of P. Chidambaram, that is 2009, Volume 9 SCC, page 66, 2009, sorry, 2019, I'm sorry, uh, 2019, 2019, Volume 9 SCC, page 66. Now, this was also a case of, let's forget the personalities involved, uh, but this was also a case under PMLA and the court granted bail considering the material and applied the traditional test. But whether now this test can be applied or not and how it should be applied, uh, because uh, you know the police power is always a very troublesome power because uh, right from the beginning in our jurisprudence, even at the time of the, the English rule or the British rule, the police power was always considered as a suspect. Because honest, if the crime takes place, an honest police officer in, tends to implicate 10 people when two are guilty because he wants to find the real two people. And a dishonest or not so honest police officer would also implicate 10 people because he would like that the two who are really guilty are let off and two who are not guilty are brought in. And therefore, there's always a need for a judicial oversight. So to grant this kind of a blanket presumption in favor of what is called police power, now it can be the designated authority, it can be enforcement directorate, it can be uh, whatever the special authorities which are created under the special acts. And if their presumption or if their words are to be taken so seriously that a person can be deprived of his, his uh, liberty and be not granted bail even if the, the normal court courts are, are inclined to grant bail. This is a very troublesome problem. At the same time, there is an argument now that, and that is the argument of the state, and you must understand and appreciate that because you never know that in your career, you would be sometime defending the state and you would be sometime appearing against the state. So the state says that these are such, so the money laundering or the black money uh, related crimes are such heinous crimes. They are making, a run, a running a havoc on the economy and they are worse than the murder. They are this, they are that. And these people should be brought to law 
and this liberal provision of bail or liberal grant of bail results in a lot of prejudice to administration of justice. Now, where to strike a balance? All this has been argued in the Supreme Court and we are awaiting for the judgment. Now, there's also one interesting judgment or the order passed by the court that in, there are a lot of cases where the person cooperates in course of investigation and he is not arrested. But ultimately, in the charge sheet, he is charged. Now, the question comes that when the court issues summons, because as per the charge sheet, he is charged and to, when the court analyzes and it finds that, yes, he should be summoned, should he be arrested? So one of the orders passed by Justice Sanjay Kishan call, this is not reported, but it's a very important order. He says that a person who has been cooperative of the investigation all throughout, so just because he's charged, he should not be arrested, but he should be released on bail and should be made to participate in the trial. Because by his conduct prior to, in course of investigation and prior to filing of the charge sheet, he has, he inspires confidence that he would be available for trial and he should be admitted to bail. Now, this is the uh, a bird's eye view for the students to consider and read more of the judgments and your books. Uh, and you would find it a very interesting uh, field of law. And you should also read it properly so that when you become lawyers, you get into the lucrative area of practice very fast. So thank you, Rajesh, and thank you, Patel Saab, for your kind words. Sir, and, my pleasure. Uh, you, it's my pleasure. Uh, so uh, now I would like to entertain some questions from students. Yes, they have any. Rajesh, my voice uh, is coming. Rajesh. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, we have certain questions from the students. Uh, sir, mm -hmm. as uh, you have elaborated Sanjay Chandra case, then Tara Singh case, then Chitambram case, in a very specified and a very well way. Sir. Now, the question is, sir, that say, for example, in the default bail under section 167 of the CRPC, the time period has already been elapsed. And the, let, let us suppose the person has been granted bail. But at the same point of time, if he's again committing certain types of things. So what the court can do, because court has a certain grounds that whether the person will not expand the area, he will be there with the police when the police, uh, when the court will ask, they can also take the uh, passport also. So sorry, these condition, if there is a hard court criminal and his chassis was not submitted because the police has not investigated in a proper way, that's why the chassis was not submitted. So it becomes a ground of the default bill. So under that condition that you know that in our country, the conviction rate is right now very less. Acquittal rate is high. So in these conditions, sir, what is your take on this? Sir? No, you see, there are two parts to your question that suppose he violates or he indulges in, if it is a new crime, he has to be again proceeded against for the new crime according to law. But if he is violating the condition of grant of the bail of, of uh, influencing witnesses or tempering with the evidence, etc., then in that case, his bail can be cancelled for the considerations which are set out in so many judgments for cancellation of the bail. Okay. So, so default bail doesn't mean that he is now immune from any uh, uh, any other uh, consideration which are applicable to a person who has normally been granted bail. So he yes. is at par with the with a person who has been granted bail in ordinary courts, and he has to abide by all considerations of making himself available. Suppose he remains absent for the trials after default bail, he can be arrested again. His bail can be cancelled. Uh, and uh, the low conviction rate, etc., is a very problematic thing because it can work both ways. Now, the low conviction rate also means that the investigation or the police is not, or the prosecution is not diligent enough to do uh, their duty properly and bring the evidence to convict a person properly. It can also mean that the accused is behind the scene uh, 
but then these are all larger questions about the administration of justice at the moment we are concerned with the concepts and there are you know so many complicated answers in so many complicated yes, sir, sir uh, another one point one more question sir in the uh, narcotics ndps act sir in the commercial quantity generally the court will not grant bail where the gravity uh, or where the quantity is very higher so sir uh, if if suppose a person has found with a lesser quantity of uh, let's say let us suppose opm or so in that condition if suppose the session court has granted the bail uh, granted the uh, means he was not granted bail okay and the matter went to the high court and high court has uh, reduced the sentence i have seen various cases in which the high court is reducing the sentences from 20 to 5 years also because the session court Uh, i do not uh, know that how the session court is uh, taking the 20 years punishment if the quantity is very less sir so in that case sir what is your take on this sir no no you see first of all these are two separate areas bail and the quantum of sentence uh these are two separate things uh and see first of all the distinction between commercial quantity and the non commercial quantity the whole idea is this that uh, there are sometimes consumers of the narcotics who are caught with a small quantity now in our jurisprudence and in our judicial thinking we treat these persons as victims because they are addicts and they need the help from society they need to be sent to the de addiction center they need to be so the law can't be turned against them and they be convicted for 5 years 10 years because they are they are being convicted so we had this famous case of ayan khan now he is you know ultimately not charged but all these young people who are caught now imagine that if they have to remain behind bars for 5 years 10 years then it becomes you know a travesty of law so therefore the people who are caught with commercial quantity are normally the people who are indulging in the smuggling activity so therefore the law draws a distinction between commercial quantity and the smaller quantity so that the people who need help of society or who need to be de addicted and who are victim of the drug addiction are not punished and only people who are punished now when the matter goes to higher court whether the sentence is reduced or yes you know again separate considerations we'll have some other session for this so, yeah sir so this is sir one last question uh, sir uh, uh, pertaining to the 436 sir you know that police has a power to grant bail correct now sir in these matters uh, sir whether they are taking any bond because and on what ground what bond they will take uh, because in the crpc it is nowhere mentioned that uh, what what is the basic amount they have to uh, give or the bond or because you know their their representative or their house people or any relative they can uh, put as a uh, guarantee for that particular person So, sir, no. in this case, sir, what is the view that what amount police has to take as uh, means for for no, this? You uh, see, section four forty onward up to four fifty, there are a lot of provisions about this procedure for bond, how to cancel, how to reduce the amount. But see, there are there are two kinds of bonds. One is the personal bond, so where you are just giving a bond, and sometimes you know in in this uh, bond for peace also is there. under 157 or something so you are just giving your personal assurance that yes i shall come whenever called upon or yes i shall maintain peace in the society so there you know no amount is there and these are all matters of discretion again because sometimes the supreme court says the bail granted with a bond of 5000 rupees 10000 rupees now these are all you you know ultimately symbolic because you are holding some other surety also liable that you know the person who is being released on bail it is also your duty to ensure that he makes himself available 
for trial, investigation, etc. So this is this is where you know our systems are more liberal in the Western societies, uh, particularly in America and Europe. Even a murder accused gets a bail immediately, but there you know the bail amount is very high. Sometimes a million dollar, two million dollar, uh, in Indian terms, you know, five crore, ten crore. Now our society doesn't can't have that kind of a burden on the accused. You are mostly poor, so we have a very liberal and a very nominal and a symbolic amount for the bails. So this is not really a question, but generally a matter of discussion. Sir, thank you, sir. It was really a very fantastic session. From the starting, you have elaborated with the bail, bailable offense, non-bailable offense, and you have also incorporated with the various aspect that is with the various case law that is the Sanjay Chandra, which is the leading case. And you have elaborated that that uh, that of the para number eleven of that Sanjay Chandra in a very specific way, sir. Uh, you have also elaborated Tara Singh case as well as the P Chidambaram case, and it was really. The uh, very fantastic session we have, we are, uh, is, it is beyond the expectation that we have understood in a very better way, sir. Now I will tell uh, Dr. M. N. Patel, sir, who is the provost to say the few words, Dr. M. N. Patel, sir, and then we have a vote of thanks by Dr. Devarti Haldar, ma'am. Uh, M. N. Patel, sir, I am audible to you, sir. Yes, yes. I'm... Yeah, yeah. Sir, uh, please give a certain. Uh, Thanks to our sir, and then uh, Dr. Devarti Haldar will give the vote of thanks. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be the part of such type of talks. No doubt, I'm not the man of law, but learning a lot every time when all the talks with the experts. Today, we enjoyed the talks by Dr. Sipallava Shishodiaji, as on the bail he spoke, and it's new for me to learn even. But it is really very much uh, interesting. I've heard the entire talk. And also question answer. Hope so that in future also you extend your services so that our student can be the beneficiary. My best wish is to all the students, those who have took the advantage of that. And we are lucky enough through Ajish, we have got the stalwart like you for our students. Hope so that we, our interaction will continue. Thank you very much. Over to Rajesh. Uh, now I will tell Dr. Devarti Haldar to officially give the vote of thanks. Dr. Devarti Haldar. Thank you, Rajesh, sir. Am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Shishodhya, sir. I belong to the group of victimologists and uh, today in my class of CRPC, I was basically discussing uh, with the students about uh, a concept called therapeutic jurisprudence. Bail basically forms a very nice portion of therapeutic jurisprudence. And I was telling that you should uh, like attend this lecture so that you will be very clear with the concept of bail and also with the concept of how bail can be applied and when in, in which cases bail may not be given. I have also attended your whole session, sir, and it was very, very uh, like you know helpful for people like me also. So on behalf of Parul Institute of Law, Parul University, I, Professor Dr. Devaruti Haldar, extend a very uh, like uh, you know deep gratitude for ex accepting our uh, like you know uh, invitation and also for delivering such a nice session. Thank you, sir. And so on see, I must note, tell you one minute. Huh? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, what what Professor Haldar said about the theoretic aspect of bail. I must tell the students, uh, and they must uh, do a little more research on that. In Jaipur, there was an experiment of keeping an open jail. Yes. Now, the open yes. jail is uh, that the convict, uh, after sentence, he remains in a certain uh, jail premises uh, through the night. But in the morning, he is allowed to go to his work, uh, place of work and he has to report back by certain time by 5 or 6 in the evening. Yes. And the whole idea was that a person's liberty is minimum, but at the same time, he is reformed in the prison. Now, this experiment has, I don't know whether it is continuing or not, or it is being repeated elsewhere, but it has certainly misfired in some, some places. So, and the other thing I want to just tell everybody is that if I am not a lawyer, I would have liked to become a professor in law. And if I'm disqualified for that, I would like to become a student of law, <laughs> which we always remain. So, so yes. many thanks to all of you. 
so it was thank very you. fantastic session by uh, you sir and i am also thankful to dr mn patel provos and uh, dr deberti helder and all the uh, staff member of the parul institute of law and all the students and uh, there are various student who are see uh, who was on the facebook live so uh, on the behalf of parul institute of law we are closing the session thanks a lot for your giving the special time to us sir thanks a lot sir thanks for your kindness so we are closing the session chalo thanks to everyone yes sir yes <laughs>